the feisty news for women. Hello and welcome to the feisty news for women. I am T. Erica. I present important women's issues and celebrate the feisty women disrupting our society to correct them. Today is February 10th, 2022. Here is the feisty news for women. The Parental Rights and Education Bill, commonly referred to as the Don't Say Gay Bill, was passed by the Florida Senate Education Committee this week. Under the House bill, a Florida school district may not encourage classroom discussion about sexual orientation or gender identity in primary grade levels or in a manner that is not age appropriate or developmentally appropriate for students, quote unquote. The bill doesn't specify how age appropriate and developmentally appropriate would be defined. The bill would also give parents the ability to sue schools if they believe the schools violated any provisions of the law. The bill proposed by Republican State Senator Dennis Baxley would extend to student support services, including counseling. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who supports the bill, said at a round table in Miami on Monday that he doesn't approve of injecting those concepts about choosing your gender at schools. Well, what does this mean for women? Women who have children who could receive proper education about the many options for their natural development will be stifled and only subjected to the bias of their family's traditions. As parents, we all think we're doing right by enforcing our traditions and beliefs onto our children, but how many of us have had to heal from the effects of what our parents taught us? Children develop naturally without interference from adults, and sadly, this natural development is thwarted by those who have lived according to patriarchal rules and want to enforce those same rules onto the next generation. The Don't Say Gay Bill is an atrocious violation of the children's freedom to accept that they become who they are naturally inclined to be. The New Zealand writer and director Jane Camion is now the first woman in history to be nominated twice for the Best Actor, for the Best Director Academy Award. She was first nominated in 2014 for The Piano. This year, Jane is picking up her second nod for The Power of the Dog. Campion's Western psychological drama explores the tense conflict that ensues between a Montana rancher and his brother after his brother brings home a new wife and her teenage son. The Power of the Dog leads the pack, which is now available on Netflix, with 12 nominations, including Best Picture, Adapted Screenplay, Actor, Supporting Actor, and Actress. Only seven women have ever been nominated for Best Director in Oscars history, and as of last year, only two have won. Congrats, Jane, and good luck. Thandie Newton gave a tearful apology to darker-skinned actresses in an emotional new interview. Thandie Newton, widely known for starring in the 2004 hit film Crash, gave a tearful apology as she discussed her new film, God's Country. In the film, she portrays a professor who confronts two white hunters on her property. The British-born actress spoke about how she had trouble taking the work, work role at first. She then went on to say, I wanted so desperately to apologize every day to darker skinned actresses, to say, I'm sorry that I'm the one chosen. My mama looks like you. It's been very painful to have women that look like my mom feel like I'm not representing them, that I'm taking from them, taking their men, taking their work, taking their truth, Newton said. Well, the reaction to her apology to dark-skinned women was both dismissive and honestly confusing. Most internet voices did not understand why Pandy felt the need to apologize to dark-skinned actresses. It is apparent that she feels a form of guilt for her success as an actress. She may have experienced the glaring stares of darker-skinned women as she continued to achieve in her profession and now carries with her a sense of guilt, eerily similar to imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is the unwarranted mentality that any success you have achieved is fraudulent and at any moment, people are gonna find out you cheated and send you back to the land of the losers. I don't have imposter syndrome. I deserve every good reward from what I work for. But Handy's imposter syndrome based on guilt over her light skin and the perceived privilege that comes with it is very sad to witness. Tandy, allow me to enlighten you. Acting is a profession. This means that roles are not given out based on purely on what you look like. If they were, I would be a superstar. 
because I'm cute. But I can't be an actress because I don't listen to directions, especially from men. And I get annoyed every, being around people every day. Plus, I don't know how to act, but you do. That is why you get the roles. You're consistent, hardworking, easy to direct, and eager to get the job done. You can be counted on. No one is suggesting otherwise. The guilt you feel is self-imposed and unnecessary. I actually read one blogger write that if you truly felt guilty, you should turn down any roles offered to you and refer a darker skinned actress. Girl, you better not. You have rightfully earned every dollar in your account and every life on your social media pages. You didn't choose your race or your physical features, but you did choose to be determined, to hone your skills, and to sacrifice the destructive desires and habits that anyone could have chosen for your dreams. You made that happen. You are not an imposter. You don't owe anyone an apology for your success. If anyone who wants to stand beside you in celebrity, she will make a way. Ask Serena Williams, ask Viola Davis. You did this, you deserve this. And anyone who expresses that they have a problem with their success is probably just angry at themselves for having too much time to focus on your career because they can't do the same for their own. You're doing great. Head high, no apologies. Keep shining. How can people with anxiety learn to ask for help when they need it? What will make a woman demand to be arrested? These stories and more when we come back after the break. Hi, I'm Stephanie and I'm on a mission to empower women in the workforce one outfit at a time. When I first started my career as a chemist and a chemical engineer for the government at age 20, my average coworker was a middle-aged male in a business suit. In order to look the part, I had to find the equivalent in women's workwear. That wasn't as easy as it sounded. Back then, there were only two options. The first were high-end boutiques where you could go spend multiple hundred dollars on one piece. Uh, this was outside my 20 year old budget. So what I ended up doing was going to the big box stores or the mall stores uh, where things were more affordable, but they were low quality and often left me looking and feeling frumpy. Because I don't believe any woman should ever have to deal with this struggle, I created Executive by Stephanie, a woman's workwear brand that is affordable, high quality, and made right here in the US. news for women. When the former Miss USA Chesley Chris made headlines nearly two weeks ago for committing suicide, every woman I know was in shock. I personally thought it was because she was murdered because I couldn't believe someone who was living the dream like she was would ever want to wake up from it. Chesley was a former Miss USA from 2019. She was a model. She was a lawyer and entertainment show correspondent. She was fit. She had long hair, the perfect body, and had more than half a million followers on Instagram, all before the age of 30. What dream did she not achieve? She was basically living every woman's dream. After her death, her mother, April, shared that Chesley was managing high-functioning depression, which she hid from everyone. As women, we understand that the world is harder on us than it is on men, and we feel that we have to be stronger and never show a weakness or a sign that we need help so we don't ask. Society has told us to be quiet so often that even through our deepest pains, they still come out as smiles. We're experiencing mental health problems and we're more likely to believe that we're just failing. Who are we to turn to? Who are we to trust with the deepest concerns of our hearts? We can't allow people to see that we too need TLC. We need someone to reassure us. We need to feel precious and valued. Who can we run to? Today, I would like to welcome Dr. Nicole Pinzak, a clinical psychologist who received her training from Harvard and Yale. Dr. Nicole specializes in helping clients with various levels of anxiety and depression. Nicole, thank you for coming to the show today. I'm gonna to ask you a tough question. You're a psychologist, but you're also a stranger. As a woman who functions with high anxiety and doesn't trust anyone, why should I trust you or any other therapist? 
Thank you, Tiarika. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And I think you bring up a really important common experience for many you know, high functioning women. Uh, they're often suffering on the inside and they can sort of get through their day and function at really high levels. And they don't think they, they need help or could benefit from help because they're, they're used to keeping it all together. Uh, it's common for people to um, have difficulty trusting others and be intimidated by the therapeutic process. I'm a clinical psychologist. I see this a lot and I can say that it's also part of the therapeutic process. Even if you don't trust a clinician um, or have, you know, it may take some time to figure out who's the right fit for you and to have that bond and that trust uh, develop over time. So don't feel like you need to go into the process automatically trusting the clinician, it makes sense that you would, um, you know, take your time to let that experience unfold. And you can always try different clinicians to see who works for you, but uh, know that treatment can really help. And we, we really need to address you know, the, the, the problems. And like you were speaking about that tragedy, you know, she was a very high functioning woman and suffered so much on the inside, but nobody else would know it. And I think that's so common. I specialize in working with patients with really high functioning anxiety and depression. And those are not recognized as clinical mental health disorders, but they're so common. And so treatment can really help. And if you're suffering, please reach out, know that it's a process, it takes time. And if you feel comfortable, you can even bring that up to the therapist. Uh, that would be a really great thing to say to your therapist and say, you know, I don't really trust this process. I'm not used to this. This is uncomfortable for me. And let them know, um, you know, part of, part of the therapy, this is a perfectly uh, typical therapeutic process. Well, Nicole, as a woman who is extremely high functionally functioning and can still achieve my goals through any mental health break, can you describe for me what it is that I would gain from breaking through my fears and talking to, through, to a therapist? How would I benefit? So I'm a clinical psychologist that specializes in what is called cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's really our gold standard approach for symptoms of anxiety and depression and stress management. And what I mean by that is that cognitive behavioral therapy is evidence-based. It's been shown in a lot of randomized control trials to be effective uh, for mental health symptoms, such as depression and anxiety and other mental health symptoms. And so I would be providing actual skills, practical skills to help you manage your stress level, symptoms of anxiety and depression to really get you to an optimal place of thriving. You're not just going to be laying on a couch, just talking to someone that's not even paying attention. You're going to uh, be learning active problem solving, coping strategies and skills that you can apply uh, to your daily life. Thank you so much, Dr. Nicole, for your explanations to these tough questions. To reach out to Dr. Nicole, visit her Instagram at Dr. Nikki Penzek or her website at Dr. Nicole Amoyo Penzek.com. Next, we have a very special guest streaming from London. It's Yasmin, the brain behind the Instagram account, Dismantle the Patriarchy. Yasmin has prepared a very special report called The Patriarchy watch, where she is watching the world for signs of the pa patriarchy, rearing its ugly head. Take it away, Yasmin. Hello, everyone. I'm Yasmin with the Patriarchy Watch, highlighting the harmful effects of our patriarchal society. The first case of patriarchy is in Iran. A psychopath in Iran was recently seen walking the streets, carrying the head of his wife, who he beheaded in an honor killing. An honor killing is a murder that happens as a result of a man's feeling that the woman's action have dishonored him. Men actually believe that they have a right to kill a woman when her behavior does not align with his beliefs of how a woman should be. Damn patriarchy. Our second case is in the UK. Last week, a report revealed police officers making sickening jokes about sexually assaulting colleagues, abusing their partners, and using disgraceful, racist, and ableist language and more. 
Feminists in the UK made 750 calls to the Home Secretary to demand an independent inquiry into misogyny and a radical overhaul of the police force. Out of roughly 750 Met officers and staff who faced sexual misconduct allegations, just 83 of them were sacked. Damn patriarchy. And finally, in Iceland, several women are collectively taking their government to the European Court of Human Rights over what they say is a misogynistic justice system that systemically violates the rights of victims of gender based violence. The strange twist in the tale these women live in Iceland which is long celebrated as the world's most gender equal country. In the case of one of the women called uh, Maria, according to court uh, documents, the injuries were caused by her boyfriend throwing her around the room while trying to wrestle her phone away from her after threatening to call the police. For days after the attack, Maria struggled to breathe. Eventually, she ended up in the emergency room. But for the police, that evidence was not enough. A year and a half after she had pressed charges, Maria says officers told her the case was being dropped because it would not lead to a conviction. Damn patriarchy. That's it from me today. Thank you for tuning in to the Patriarchy Watch. I am Yasmin, keeping my eyes wide open for women's progress. Follow me on Instagram at Dismantle the Patriarchy for a wider view. Back to you, T. Erica. Thanks, Yasmin, for the patriarchy watch. A very insistent Louisiana woman got her wish this weekend when she demanded to be taken into police custody. Sharon Watley was arrested in the parking lot of the Wachata Parish Sheriff's Office annex when she refused to leave the premises, insisting that she needed to turn herself in. PSO deputies found no outstanding warrants on file for Wiley and no reason to book her. However, when she repeatedly refused to leave the parking lot, despite multiple police commands, she was arrested on one count of criminal trespass, according to the Monroe police. Watley was taken to the Wachita Correctional Center. What? Why? If you have any idea why she was demanding to be arrested, please leave a comment and let us know. Thank you so much for watching the feisty news for women. Remember, be feisty. Why? Because women must be seen and heard.